Okay, so we're talking about the media that we use in the clinical microbiology lab. These are the things that we use most commonly, the purpose behind them, what they have in them, what they can show us, what they do for us. We talked about categories of media back in chapter one, right? Okay, um, and enriched media has the extra nutrients that help to allow those most fastidious organisms to grow. Selective media has inhibitors added to it so that you can <clears throat> um, only grow the things that you want to grow that inhibits the growth of the things you don't want. Differential media allows us to actually see differences between different populations of organisms. Okay. There's something else called enrichment media. Okay, and don't forget we also have that transport media, but enrichment media is always some sort of a broth. And what we do is we put specimens into the broth and it has the ability to get rid of certain things or inhibit certain things and enrich the recovery of things that we might be able to, that are only in low numbers potentially. So one of the things that we we use is like a limb broth um, for group B strep. So it might be in low numbers, but that can cause real problems during pregnancy um, to the baby. So we want to make sure that we don't have that going on and we can put give antibiotics um, during vaginal birth or throughout that process. So that's that's an example of an enrichment medium. Okay. Transport medium has just enough stuff in there to keep the critter alive, but not enough so that he's going to overgrow, multiply, start growing like crazy, right? Okay. So the first medium, we've talked about this, we've seen this, we understand it, I hope by now. Blood auger. Blood auger has intact red blood cells added to it. Okay, so intact red cells help to provide extra nutrients. Okay, we're given the, we use sheep's blood, 5% sheep's blood. Um, there are different manufacturers that use horse blood, uh, rabbit blood, whatever, but sheep's blood is actually um, a really good thing to use because we don't have any common antigens or antibodies that we have to worry about. Okay, so the sheep's blood is added, the red cells are intact, and it allows us to see the differences between different organisms based on homolysis. If the organism produces a toxin or an enzyme that can completely break down the red cell, then it'll produce the beta homolysis, that clear zone around the colony. If it only does a little bit of damage, but doesn't completely lyse the red cell, um, poke holes in it and whatnot. It'll allow some contents out, but doesn't completely destroy the cell. Then you're going to see that greenish alpha homolysis. Okay. So this picture, you have the alpha where you can see the green zone around all of the stuff growing. The beta, where it's completely cleared out around it. Okay, you can see the plasma left behind, behind. And then the gamma, which we do not ever tell people that there's gamma homolysis. You just tell them where there's alpha or beta, because gamma means there's no homolysis. So why would you tell them and say, there's nothing there? Okay, so don't tell me that there's gamma homolysis. Tell me there's no homolysis. No homolysis seen. It's green. It's actually a green color. On blood? 
is on blood. I don't know. It's probably. Oh, that has to do with, um, that has to do with, uh, byproducts, cellular products. Yeah. That's just cellular products. That's not hemolysis at all. That's just the, the biochemical changes that per, are produced and it changes the appearance of the plate. Okay. Yeah. It's not an actual hemolysis. Okay. Chocolate auger. That's also enriched. What happens is we put the blood in. Um, we heat it up to allow all those cells to lyse and we cool it. So we're adding the red cells that now we lyse them and we allow all the hemoglobin, the hemo heme, um, NAD, that's a big thing. NAD is, um, oh God, Brittany, what is it? Nicotinamide. It's some stupid thing. Um, FAD, NAD, remember how you had NADH2s in your Krebs cycle? NAD, that's the stuff. And then it becomes reduced. Um, <laughs> I'm like, I can tell you what it is. I can't tell you what the name of it is. Um, <clears throat> but that's what we call something called, it's V factor. And chocolate auger produces both X or has both X and V factor in it that is are necessary to grow homophilus. Um, so it says down here, homophilus influenza requires both X and V factor to grow. There are some that only require X factor. There are some that only require V factor. There are some, and homophilus influenza requires both. So um, if you see growth on chocolate, but not on blood, that means it was needing that X and or V. So it's, it's interesting. Right. Um, <clears throat> Columbia CNA, colistin nalodixic acid. Colistin is, um, an antibiotic. Nalodixic acid is an antibiotic. These things are used to inhibit the gram negative bacteria and, um, we have most CNA, Columbia CNA uh, have the sheep's blood, the intact red cells, so that you can also see hemolysis on it. Okay, so it is um, a selective media because it is to grow gram positives and fungus. But it can also be differential in that it shows hemolysis. Okay. Um, Sometimes you will get Proteus growing, but it usually doesn't grow past that first quadrant. Like we saw in today's lab where the Staph aureus is inhibited out, way out. If I did the whole plate for the Staph aureus, you would have seen probably a different story. You probably would have seen it only growing in the grand pot in the first quadrant, maybe a couple colonies in the second and nothing else. Um, and remember, you need more than just like one to three colonies to consider it growing in that um, quadrant. So, PEA, the phenyl ethyl alcohol auger, um, or phenyl ethanol auger, <clears throat> you can get PEA in with blood so it it has blood and that's this plate over here um you cannot detect hemolysis because the alcohol actually disrupts the cell membrane so it won't show hemolysis and i cannot tell you how many people look at pea and go oh it's a red plate so i need to be able to look at hemolysis i'm like nope you'll not see hemolysis on pea sorry um, but you can also get them without the blood and the additional nutrients in there. So, uh, the PEA actually inhibits the gram negatives because of that outer membrane that's on that cell wall. 
So it inhibits the gram negatives just by the mere presence of the alcohol. Mannitol salt. I'm trying to make this bigger. It's not letting me. Um, the mannitol salt auger, we talked about the mannitol salt auger a little bit. Um, mannitol salt auger has salt, increased amount of salt. Um, when we do salt broths to find out if the things will grow in high amounts of salt, we only use 6.5% sodium chloride. So mannitol salt has an even higher amount, that's 7.5% sodium chloride. So we're talking high amounts of salt. Um, and staph species will grow in a really salty environment. Okay, so will some micrococcus. So will some fungus, but you know, we're looking at bacteria, so. Uh, then we need to look at <clears throat> the, um, who will actually grow in this salty concentration. That's the selective nature. The differential piece is that phenol red, right, as the indicator, with the mannitol. So we're looking to see if mannitol can be fermented, and if fermentation occurs, it changes that phenol red to a yellow color. Okay, so it's acidic. Any fermentation typically ends up with an acidic byproduct, and the acidic byproduct will turn either the media and or the colonies yellow. Okay, um, if it's alkaline, okay, goes the opposite route. Um, you can get the pink color. Okay, so staph epidermis tends to become pink, um, like a brighter pink color. Uh, staph aureus is the only staph that ferments mannitol. Oh crap, sorry, I thought I went too far. <clears throat> McConkie 2. McConkie auger was developed to be selective for gram-negative enteric organisms. So, gram-negative, they have the cell wall with the thin peptidoglycan and the outer membrane. Enteric means that they inhabit the intestines. Okay. So the gram-negative organisms that are normally found in the intestines are what we're looking for. So what it did, what we did was we added crystal violet, because crystal violet will inhibit gram-positives. Um, it'll inhibit gram-positive bacteria. It will not inhibit yeast. Okay, you will and can find yeast growing on McConkie. And we have the bile salts to get rid of some of those other extraneous gram negatives that aren't normally found in the, in, in the intestines. It'll be okay in just a minute. It's that blowdown for the, <laughs> for the autoclave. Okay. So that's what makes this selective, but then we also have that differential piece. And the differentiation for McConkie is lactose fermenting. So we're looking for the lactose fermentation, and of course we're looking for a color change again. This, of course, is going to use that neutral red as the pH indicator. And if the pH drops below 6.8 into that acidic range, then you're going to get pink to red colonies. Okay. You'll notice at this upper area here where there's a lactose fermenter here and then there's this other lactose fermenter and like the whole outside area has turned pink too. E. coli does that a lot. That's um 
the precipitation of the bile salts around it, it's now turning that pink color. Okay. Um, there used to be, an, of course, we're on McConkie 2 auger, right? McConkie 2 helps to inhibit the swarming of the proteus so that if there is proteus present, you're still going to be able to see all the other gram negatives as well because they're ne it's not going to grow over everybody else. The original McConkie was um, interesting when you got a proteus on it. <clears throat> what is E. coli? Is it a lactose fermenter or non-lactose fermenter? It's a lactose fermenter, right? So it's going to turn pink on McConkie. All right. Well, there is another E. coli that we are constantly on the lookout for, um, and that is E. coli 0157H7 which is the really bad mamma jamma that can cause enterohemorrhagic um, E. coli and kill you. So that's a big baddie. And what we need to use is this McConkie 2 with Sorbitol because um, E. coli's other than E. coli 0157H7 will ferment the Sorbitol. Okay, so what you're looking for, you're getting a regular McConkie plate, and it's, an, it's a lactose fermenter, so it's pink, right? And you get a McConkie with sorbitol, so now we're looking for sorbitol fermentation instead of lactose fermentation, and it's pink. Oh, okay, I'm good. We don't have to worry about that. But if you get a regular McConkie, and it's pink, and the McConkie is with sorbitol, and it's not pink we need to start looking a little further because E. coli 0157H7 um, either ferments it so slow or doesn't do it at all so it comes up colorless on the McConkie with Sorbitol. So it's a, it's a diagnostic thing to be able to say, okay, so it ferments lactose but it doesn't ferment Sorbitol and we know that this is an E. coli because you're going to learn that distinctive smell of E. coli. Um, so again you're still looking for is it pink or not because it's still the neutral red it's just a different recipe so a different um this is actually a, a sorbitol is a um sugar or an alcohol it's a sugar alcohol <clears throat> all right eosin methylene blue that's what we use today in lab emb and EMB is selective for gram negatives. Okay, again, we're trying for those enteric gram negative organisms. Now, did we see Staph aureus grow? Yes, but was it inhibited? <laughs> yes, okay, it was inhibited. Um, it didn't grow all the way out to four plus, all the way to the end. Um, <clears throat> so, what happened is we add the eosin, which you guys remember eosin is what color dye? Red. Eosinophils, right? Red. Okay. And methylene blue is what color dye? Blue and red and blue make purple, right? So the media actually looks purplish. Okay. Um, so what we're looking for when we see lactose and or sucrose fermentation because it has both of these things in there um <clears throat> we're looking for a really super dark colony okay it's a really like dark 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 purpley black color okay um so you'll notice this guy here is lactose negative and he almost looks pink okay or the same color as the medium to begin with right this looks like a darker purple or a grayish purple color notice it says brown to blue black it can be blue it can be purple it can be it can be brown it can be black it can be if it's dark go for it 
okay? This guy um, has the metallic green sheen on him because he is a rapid lactose fermenter, okay? Does it really well, produces a whole lot of um, acid, so because of that, it develops that weird greenish metallic sheen to it. There is one thing that you need to understand, and I'm going to repeat this probably five times before you're done with all of the micro classes. Staph aureus is not always beta hemolytic. E. coli is not always a lactose fermenter. There are, and you're going to be like, I swear this is E. coli. It has that smell and blah, 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 right? It is E. coli. Trust, trust your gut. Prove it. But yeah, it's probably E. coli. There are non-lactose fermenting E. coli. Um, I told you today, bugs do not always do what we expect them to do. Their E. coli and staph aureus are everywhere, and you just expect them to be anywhere. Always look, always be on the lookout for them, because they could be anywhere. And they come in all different shapes, shapes, sizes, colors, weird. Okay. Um, so when it says most strains of E. coli produce a green metallic sheen, but not all, this is true. Most E. coli come up as lactose fermenters on McConkie, but they don't know. So it's something that you're going to learn really quickly. Okay. Hectone enteric auger is another one that we used today. We saw for our first time today. It's that green medium. Uh, <clears throat> again, it is selective in that it has bile salts to select for our gram negatives or, or, or our enteric gram negatives. Um, this includes lactose and or and sucrose. So we saw today that Proteus vulgaris does sucrose fermentation but not lactose fermentation because it was a, a non-lactose fermenter on McConkie but then it had that um, yellowy orange, salmon orange color colony on the hectone and teric. So we're like, well, but if it's not a lactose fermenter, oh, so it must be a sucrose fermenter. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I am not, listen, I am not going to ask you what your pH indicator is on hectone enteric. You know why? There aren't any other green augers that you're going to be using that look like this stuff. Okay. Now, TSI and McConkie's, they both are pinkish, reddish color, so you need to know which one, which pH indicator is which. They have two different ways to go. One goes yellow, one goes pink, right? So that's, that's a clue, okay? Hectone and enteric auger will also <coughs> um, show us H2S producers. Now, Nobody had any black centers in their colonies today, right? I didn't think so. Um, it's still too young. Typically, the Proteus vulgaris, it takes the 48 hours of incubation to, to show the H2S production. Um, plus the fact that it's still a young culture. It's only technically two days old. Um, and it should be older than that when I start using it. Shame on me. Um, but this has the ferric ammonium citrate. Okay. Ferric, there's iron in there. Um, sodium thiosulfate, that's a very common thing. Anything where you see sulfate in there, you're looking for hydrogen sulfide production. Okay. Especially if there's ferric something with it, because that's going to make that black color. Okay. So, <clears throat> we have a sucrose fermenter or a lactose fermenter over here. We don't know which one it's doing because we don't have a McConkie to look at with it, right? So, it could be either or. <clears throat> Shigella and Salmonella are part of the reason why we have hectone enteric. Okay. 
because they are non-lactose fermenters. And salmonella will produce a black center in the colony or a black colony because they produce H2S. Okay. So some of you guys saw salmonella on your TSIs, right? And they were black, 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 black. Okay. Um, Shigella is a lazy critter and he doesn't do much of anything. He's non lactose fermenter. He doesn't do any whole, whole bunch of carbohydrate fermentation. He doesn't produce H2S. He doesn't want to do this. He doesn't want to do that. There's a, a lot of negatives when we start looking at all the things that we test for for our enteric organisms. So I would expect that you understand that both of these are colorless and or green because they're going to be not lactose fermenting and not sucrose fermenting, but that salmonella can be differentiated from shigella by the H2S production. XLD is another medium that we use that is helpful in differentiating Salmonella and Shigella from other organisms. Um, <clears throat> so this has xylose in it, and the xylose is something that not everybody uses and can ferment. Um, the sodium deoxycholate helps to inhibit the gram positive organisms, but the 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 xylose can be utilized by Shigella species. So if you're looking at, you know, if you're looking at all your plates and some places use XLD media, um, a lot of them don't anymore just because it was so stinking expensive. Um, I will tell you one lab that uses it all the time is the poultry lab down here, the UD lab, because they are always looking for salmonella. Okay, so they need to be able to tell the difference between those non-lactose fermenters and whether it's H2S positive or not. So they use XLD on a regular basis. Um, and it would tell the difference between Salmonella or Shigella because Shigella would have the, the xylose um, and have a, a yellowish tinge. Okay, so or not in yellowish sense, or, um, clear colonies, but then the salmonella would have the black colonies. It's a long day. So lysine, if we have lysine de decarboxylation, and one of the things that we look at all the time, we're looking at lysine decarboxylation, arginine decarboxylation, and ornithine decarboxylation. So ornithine decarboxylation is one of those tests that we set up this week in the MIO media, the purple media. Okay. Find out if they're taking the carboxyl group off of the end of this amino acid. It's terrible. Okay. Um, and then the H2S production. Look, sodium thiosulfate and some sort of ferric something or other. Right? There's always iron to make the black stuff. Thiosulfate has the H2S production. Okay. Going one more step. There is Salmonella Shigella auger. Okay. What makes it selective? It's going to inhibit more than just gram positives. It's going to try to inhibit most of those gram negatives that it lives with as well in the in the intestines. So bile salts, is that going to inhibit those coliforms that live in your gut? No, because that's what we want is produce that. Um, sodium citrate, didn't we just see that on the last one? No, that was sodium deoxycholate. Um, sodium citrate, hmm, 
Brilliant green. Brilliant green is going to inhibit gram positives. Bile salts going to inhibit gram positive. Sodium citrate will help to inhibit those coliforms. All right. Uh, differential, again, based on lactose and or sucrose fermentation. It's got both of them in there. And it does neutral red, the same as McConkie. So it's going to turn pink if there's fermentation. We're looking at black colonies or black centers to the colonies if we have hydrogen sulfide production. Okay. Look, ferric something or other and sodium thiosulfate. Black precipitate, right? Have you noticed that it's ferric ammonium something all the time? All right. Now, I'm teaching you all this stuff. And there are a lot of labs that don't even do stool cultures anymore. There are still some that do it. So I have to teach it as long as you guys are being tested on it. And as long as there is, it is in practice out there. So can't help it, but there are some places that still do this. So as you can see, E. coli is a lactose fermenter, so it's going to turn pink. Um, salmonella and shigella, not pink, right? It doesn't, they're not going to do the, the sucrose or the lactose. And then salmonella will have those black colonies. There is actually, um, a, an enrichment broth media that you can put your stools into before plating onto SSA, uh, that will help in the recovery of salmonella and shigella also. C-I-N, I cannot say this, so I just say C-I-N, because I'm not going to try to butcher that on, on screencast <laughs> Um Starts with a C, starts with an I, starts with an N. Why? Because there's three different things that we add, three different things that we add that are going to Get rid of all the other crap and only allow your cinnamon and aromones species. Okay. Why is that important? Well, because they can be um, some pretty bad mamma jammas. There's your cinnia pestis causes black plague. Okay. And yes, we still have black plague in this country today happens every year. Um, Aeromonas can cause some really devastating results also. So it's important for us to be able to find these things. So crystal violet sodium disoxycholate, you guys already know that's going to inhibit the gram positives, right? Because we've seen those on other media, the cefsaldine, ergacin. See, I can do it when I do it that way, but I can't do it when I try and say the name. I don't understand. And novobicin, they'll all help to, those are things that will help to inhibit, including antibiotics, that will help to inhibit all those other things, all the gram negatives, all the stuff. How is it differential? We're looking at mannitol fermentation with a neutral red pH indicator. Neutral red turns pink when it's acidic. So mannitol fermentation, in this case for CIN, not MSA, CIN, it's going to turn pink or red. Okay, these things, typical Yersinia or Aramonis, they have a red center, have an almost clear outer edge to the colony. They're so cute. They look like little red eggs. You know how they have the egg yolk and then the egg white. It looks like the yolk is red in the middle of this egg. It's, they're cool looking. TCBS, the thiosulfate citrate bile salt, sucrose, I always forget the sucrose, um, agar, sucrose is important because what is it that we're looking for? Sucrose fermentation. Um, but thiosulfate, that should give you a clue, right? H2S production. Um, citrate, so it's got the ferric citrate. Notice it's ferric something, right? It's not ferric ammonium citrate this time, it's just ferric citrate. Uh, 
with that thiosulfate, sodium fluoride thiosulfate, black for any H2S. Uh, bile salts will help to inhibit the gram positives. We have, we intentionally screw with the pH on this thing um, to make it very high pH so that that also inhibits normal flora. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> and what we're trying to grow on our TCBS is Vibrio species. And Vibrio causes a bunch of different things. One of them is it causes intestinal diarrhea, um, causes cholera, uh, causes some crazy wounds that are like flesh eating wounds. Um, there's a lot of stuff that Vibrio can do. You'll learn about that when we get to micro two. Um, but Vibrio are important to be able to find because we don't always look for them actively. And they don't grow on normal media. So you have to have some sort of clue as to what you're looking for. Um, so TCBS auger is typically a green medium. Now, I did tell you that we don't normally see H, anything other than HE, right? TCBS is a special request. They have to request that you're looking for Vibrio. It used to be that across the board, this is what we're doing, this is what our stool culture is, and then we would say, they, they would put a comment in that would ask us to plate for, you know, add media for Vibrio and Yersinia. Okay. Not anymore. Now you actually, there's a special, because of all the coding and stuff, you ha they have to actually ask specifically for it now. Um, which is okay because, you know, it helps us to cover the cost of the plates and how many things that we have to do to QC these things and then we never use them. Um, they expire before we use them. It's terrible stuff. So Vibrio uh, cholera turns yellow. Vibrio parahemolyticus is green. What sugar is being fermented on the TCBS for by Vibrio cholera? What's the last S, Sam? What's sucrose? The one that I always forget, right? Uh, Campylobacter auger. Campylobacter jejuni is another intestinal pathogen. Campylobacter auger um, is selective in that we add five different antibiotics to inhibit and suppress all of that other crap that can be found in the intestines. Um, and Campylobacter have to be grown at 42 degrees Celsius. And they have to be grown in their own special environment. So you have a little, you have to put in your own gas generator just for Campylobacter. So you have to keep a special incubator just for Campylobacter. You have to have these special bags so that you can generate the right atmosphere for them. And you have to have special media. Now ask me how often in a year's time you normally get a Campylobacter species growing out. Not many. You might get five in a big city hospital or something. I mean, <laughs> not very often. Um, so it's a lot of overhead to do a Campylobacter culture. So I'm very happy to see that we have um, more molecular diagnostics happening for stools and we don't have to keep all these ridiculous things on hand any longer. <clears throat> All right, modified Thayer Martin. Modified Thayer Martin is modified Thayer Martin, New York City auger. 
gem back plates. I think gem back might be on here too. Um, and plain old regular Sayer Martin. There's something else too. I can't remember what it is. These all are selective for, we're looking for gonococcus. Okay. They will also allow meningococcus to grow on them. Okay. We only ever use the modified Thayer Martin when we're looking at um, genital stuff. Okay. So, because we're looking specifically for gonococcus. Meningococcus will grow on chocolate too. And it's easy to find. So, that's not too bad. But gonococcus doesn't grow very readily. Um, it will grow on chocolate, but it gives you more of a clue when something's growing on the Thayer Martin and we're like, oh, okay. So now we need to find out, is it gram negative diplococci? Is it catalase positive? Yes. Yes. Oh, is it oxidase positive? Yes. Did it come from a genital site? Yes. Oh crap. Now we need to do enzyme testing. Okay. So it's, it's really that simple like you need to know where it came from you need to know what you, it can do um but the chocolatiness just like chocolate auger provides both the x and b factors we actually now have this stuff called isovitalics 2 i think it is um which provides the x and the v factor so they don't actually have to add the blood anymore but you know um, there's four antibiotics. Vancomycin inhibits gram positives. Colistin inhibits gram negatives. Nystatin inhibits the fungus. And the trimethoprim will help the prote inhibit proteus swarming. So we keep it out of there. So we um, swab these things in a Z streak. This is actually a Gembeck plate right here. They come in a little plastic container, and when you take the specimen, you roll your swab on the plate, and then you send the plate in, and when we get the plate into the lab, we streak across the, the Z, either this way, I, we usually do them this way, so that you can see that it's not from the swabbing piece of it. Um, but they'll grow as like these little pearly, whitish gray colonies on the Thayer Martin and the Jembeck plates. <clears throat> I did talk about limb broth being an enrichment broth and it is selectively enrichment selective in trying to selectively enrich the growth and recovery of Streptococcus agalactiae. We met Streptococcus agalactiae. We worked with it. We saw it on our things. Okay. Um, it has the nalidixic acid and colistin to inhibit the gram negative organisms. So we're hoping to only find gram positives. We're hoping to enhance the recovery of Strep agalactiae. GN broth is also an enrichment broth. And what does what does GN what do you see when you or what do you think of when you see GN? Say it louder. Gram negatives, right? So what we're actually looking for is the things that are the most common gram negative pathogen that we're looking for when we're talking about enteric organisms and that's salmonella and shigella so we have salmonella and shigella auger okay there's salmonella and shigella enrichment broth there's also gn broth and the gn broth also um will help to recover salmonella and shigella so what we do is we get the stool we put it in the gn broth we incubate the gn broth till the next day we pull it out we sub it onto plates to find out if anything's going to grow, if there were any salmonella or shigella in there. Okay. So again, the sodium citrate, sodium disoxycholate inhibits gram negatives and maintains 
the normal fecal flora in the lag phase. What does that mean to you? It means that what? It's not going to grow. Those normal flora are not going to go into that extrapolation where we get in that exponential phase. It's going to stay in that, oh, I'm getting to collect my nutrients and getting ready to multiply, right? You guys remember the growth curve? It's never getting to this point, so they don't increase in population. They're going to stay static. Thioglycoly broth. <clears throat> um, you can get thioglycoly with indicator or without indicator. What does that mean, Mrs. Maria? I don't understand. Okay, so thioglycoly broth, one of the things that we look for is where growth is occurring in the broth. If it's growing only on the very top surface, then it's probably an obligate aerobe. If it's only growing in the very bottom, it's probably an obligate anaerobe. If it's growing just below the surface, it's probably microaerophilic. Do you guys remember hearing about this stuff? Right? Nothing? A little bit? Yeah. Okay. Um, but then there are those facultative anaerobes that are going to grow throughout the entire broth, right? There's an indicator called resazarin, okay? which will tell you whether your broth has too much oxygen in it for you to be able to grow those anaerobes. So they're already pre-reduced when you get them, so they should be a nice bright yellow color. And then if they start getting too much oxygen in them, then it turns a pinky color. So what then you have to do is you take those broths and you loosen the caps and you boil them for a few minutes and tighten the caps back up and it gets all the oxygen out of it. You have to re-reduce the broths before you can use them. Or you won't be able to tell the difference between where these things are growing. Um, see the little balls? There are also things called pellicles that grow in little streaks or lines. Um, and that tells us a lot of times the difference between whether it's a staph, staphylococcal organism or a streptococcal organism. You'll learn it later. Okay. Talks about transport medium. Transport medium is there to help to maintain viability, not to increase numbers of the organisms, right? And there's something called a backup broth. And this is one of the things that we do a lot. We'll put our specimens on plate, we'll plate them on, on media, and then we'll put it in the thioglycolate broth or a brain heart infusion off, um, off broth so that it's very nutrient. In case the things are in such low number that you're not going to find them on the plates, they'll still grow in the broth. And then you sub that broth the next day to see if you see anything growing on that that wasn't growing on the original plates. Okay. So that's all a recovery thing. It's, it's your backup method, just in case there wasn't a lot of them. There you go. There we go.